In the previous video, we introduced the concept of a black box. Of course, the big question is, what purpose does it serve in quantum computing? I'm glad you asked, because before quantum computers can start revolutionizing cryptography and AI, we have to answer a very simple question. Can a quantum computer actually perform a computation more efficiently than a classical computer? Before proceeding, let's define what efficiency means. Recall the guessing game from the last video. The goal of that game was not to simply discover the number I was thinking of. It was to discover the number using the fewest number of guesses. My friend on the left required 73 guesses, while my friend on the right only required 6. Therefore, my friend on the right guessed more efficiently. Basically, we need to demonstrate that a quantum algorithm can solve a problem using a fewer number of guesses than a classical algorithm. Such a problem is not one of the grandiose scientific breakthroughs we mentioned earlier. It would be as simple and impractical as guess a number between 1 and 100. It's essentially the equivalent of Elon Musk unveiling the next Tesla model to be a go-kart. The computation used to prove quantum supremacy would be a cheap parlor trick. In fact, the earliest quantum algorithms from the 1990s were just that, cheap parlor tricks. Do I care about identifying whether or not a function is constant or balanced? Absolutely not. Does the fact that a function is 1 to 1 or 2 to 1 impact me in any way? Not at all. Does a quantum computer's ability to find the prime factors of any number have any relevance in my life? Um, actually this one does because it could render RSA cryptography useless and nullify all privacy on the internet. The aforementioned algorithms are important because they demonstrate that there are indeed problems that only a quantum computer can effectively solve. Those were the necessary predecessors to the more practical algorithms that get the spotlight nowadays, such as Grover's algorithm and Shor's algorithm. These ancient quantum algorithms are collectively referred to as the black box problems. Huh, black box, you say? How convenient. We just spent 4 minutes and 11 seconds discussing black boxes. What are the odds? The reason a black box is the perfect platform for constructing quantum algorithms is because of its generality. In the last video, we saw that the only relevant components of a black box are the inputs and the outputs. The only information my friends needed to discover my number was a numerical guess and the higher or lower response I provided. Nothing about the properties of the number, i.e. the internal design of the black box, was necessary. But before we continue, we must discuss an essential concept. Reversibility. In quantum computing, all operations must be reversible. What is reversibility, you ask? Here is an operation that accepts two inputs, either of which can be a 0 or a 1. It will output a 1 only if both inputs are 1. If I hide the inputs and you see an output of 1, you know for a fact that both inputs were 1. However, if I hide the inputs and you see an output of 0, you don't know whether the inputs were 0 and 1, 1 and 0, or 0 and 0. In other words, information was lost. Since there are two possible outputs and four possible input combinations, it's impossible for this operation to be reversible. Quantum computing forbids this. We must be able to rewind an operation and acquire the inputs just as easily as we obtain the outputs. And since quantum black boxes consist of quantum operations, even if we don't know the details of those operations, the black box must be reversible. Therefore, the number of inputs and outputs must be equivalent. Quantum oracles are mathematically adjusted to accommodate this requirement. Okay, now that we've established the basic rules, let's see this all in action. The black box problems follow this general pattern. There is a black box, big surprise I know, that is also commonly referred to as the oracle. The oracle performs some function f on some number of inputs consisting of zeros and ones and produces an equivalent number of outputs consisting of zeros and ones. Our goal is to determine some property of this function. The Deutsch problem is a good demonstration of this. This oracle can produce two types of outputs a constant output, which outputs 0 regardless of the input, or 1 regardless of the input, or a balanced output, which outputs an equivalent number of zeros and ones. The problem is to determine whether the oracle's function is constant or balanced. A classical computer would need to ask the oracle to perform the operation twice to answer this question, because it needs to know what happens to a 1 and a 0 separately, and then compare those results to see if they were the same or the opposite. 
the Deutsch algorithm proves that a quantum computer only needs to ask the oracle once to answer this question, thanks to its use of superposition. In this case, we can imagine the quantum algorithm to be my friend on the right, and the classical algorithm to be my friend on the left. They can both solve the problem, but the quantum algorithm needs to ask the oracle fewer times. Therefore, it is more efficient. Just to reiterate, this problem serves no practical purpose. None of the black box problems do. But they were the first true quantum algorithms and the first to indicate that quantum supremacy is possible. They set the stage for the more flashy algorithms that tackle relevant problems. With that being said, I'm going to stash all my bitcoins under my bed in preparation for the inevitable demise of RSA encryption. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.